we were doing meetings for a long time, like Heather said, we're broadcasting before there was live social media broadcast. We were doing it through different portals and platforms. And we were going around the country and we took a team of 40 with us and we had TV equipment and we would set up every night in a different location. We'd set up a set every night. And we'd go around the country and we ministered and I preached a new message every night because there was an audience with me every night watching the next evening. So I couldn't preach the same thing. And so I'd prepare all these messages and finally we built online Bible schools. We did all this stuff. We graduated hundreds of people and at no charge, we just gave it all away, just trained people. There I am again. And uh, we just trained people. And um, the bottom line is it was, um, it was really powerful. We did all that. But rural communities was in our heart, and we realized we couldn't get to everybody. We realized that there was a season God had us set down, and it was, it was great. And during that season that we sat down, God began to speak to me, and we started live broadcasting. And our heart is to reach rural communities. People that say, you know, I have a church, or maybe I don't really have a church. I'm in transition, and what do I do? So we make an online platform available for people to go to church, where Heather and I just teach the Bible. You know, I heard this uh, just before I came up here, and I'm going to get into some stuff that I think is going to really help you get your breakthrough. But I, I man, I, I was sitting on the front row, and I just, I began to sense this in my spirit. How many of you really want to please God? Like, you just really want to please Him. You know, that's the reason we read the Bible. I, I want to say this for a second. And it was when Young was talking about tithing or giving, sowing. And today there's this crazy thing where people are so wrapped up and, you know, tithing's not an Old Testament thing. I don't have to do this. I don't have to do that. I don't read the Bible to try to figure out what I don't have to do. You understand? There's things that, you know, I don't know how to say this. If you... Man, if you torture the data long enough, you can make it confess to just about anything. So if you read the Bible to see how you can wiggle a lot of stuff or try to figure things out, you'll find avenues. You can do it. But if you read the Bible to crucify your flesh, if you read the Bible to grow in your relationship with Jesus, because people say, you know, I'm a disciple. If I were to ask people, are you a disciple? And they say, yes, I'm a disciple of Jesus. And if I were to ask them, how do you know you're a disciple of Jesus? Many people are like, they would say, because I love him. I know him because I love him. I worship him. That does not make you a disciple, which is awesome. I think that's awesome. But a disciple is someone who follows the words of Jesus. They follow the written word of God. And not like a legalist, but in a relationship. You read the Bible to draw near to him because you can't know him without the word. And people say, no, it's a relationship. It's not about a book. That is stupid. Let me just say it better. That's stupid. <laughs> There's like this disdain for the Word of God today, especially in the prophetic community. Woo! You know, whatever, man. You're destined for error and stupidity if you're not rooted, and I'm talking baptized in that Word of God. Yeah. Word and Spirit is where the horsepower is. You know, when all the emotions leave and you don't feel the uh, shaka, Holy Ghost, when, when you don't feel that, and you won't sometimes, the Word of God will stand up in you. Principles will stand up in you. The bedrock, that iron you know, that God puts inside you, that steel that He puts in your spine by the written Word of God will stand up in you. You want to get a word high? Go to Psalm 119. Read the whole thing out loud to your own soul. Man. Uh, praise God. So, that's the big thing, is that if you really love the Lord and you want to do things, and you know, I think about this, you know, in the, in the areas of giving and receiving, it's almost like the more that people beg and plead for money, the more that they are, um, the more they're carnal. I love to give opportunity to give. You know, I love the way Young was doing it. Isn't that great? So wonderful. But when we do sowing and reaping and you get into that stuff, if you understand what the Bible says, that's the most exciting part of a service for me. I get all jazzed up over that. Sowing and reaping. And you ask why? Well, because Heather and I were so broke we couldn't afford to pay attention years ago. <laughs> when I talk about broke, we were broke. 
It was embarrassing. It was beyond words. I remember it was so bad. I don't even know how to go into it, but it was so bad um, that when we started giving, I remember I wanted to step into things God had for me, and the Lord began to challenge me. The way to get where you're called to go is prayer, fasting, doing the things, but it is radical, radical giving. And if you look in the Word of God and try to get yourself out of certain ways of giving, well, you're just eliminating part of God's economy. That's all. And I think the Lord keeps it a little elusive. You ever heard the believers that are like, tithing's not the New Testament. <laughs> yeah, it is. Come on, David. Tithing's not the New Testament. Well, it's in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 8. You know what I'm talking about? How many of you read your Bible? No, I'm just kidding. But like, <laughs> Hebrews chapter 7, verse 8. What is it talking about? Well, I feel an anointing, right? You know, the offering's over, so now I can really get to it. <laughs> get them buckets out. Hallelujah. That's not what I'm doing. No, tithing in the New Testament, Hebrews 7, verse 8. I, I believe it was Paul who wrote Hebrews. Hard to say, but he probably did. But he's saying, here, in this earth right now, he said, mortal men receive tithes. And people say, now listen, tithing's not in the New Testament. You can't say that. It's not in the New Testament. That's an Old Testament, Old Covenant principle. But yet Hebrews, the last time I checked, I think that's written in the New Testament. So here, mortal men receive tithes. Now remember, this is after Jesus died, was resurrected, New Testament. Here mortal men receive tithes, and he says something really wild. But there, he receives them. Uh-oh. Of whom it is witnessed that he lives. So let me put this in crayon. Here, when men give into the offering, tithes, offerings, whatever, there is, I remember the first time I ever sowed into an offering when I was younger. I, I think I gave like, $50, $100. Actually, the first radical offering I ever gave was a watch. I didn't have anything, so I threw a watch in the bucket. Didn't know what to do. I'm like, I don't know. My heart's touched. Clunk. <laughs> and I watched the offering go, and as it went, I was just like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I could still get it back. That's right. I, I'm just looking at it like, oh, I, I just thought, what? Why am I giving this anyway? You know, it's just going to some man or some building or some entity and organization. I'm not giving to God. I'm giving to the preacher. <laughs> right? Watch the offering go. But it says here, mortal men, yes, they do receive the physical resources, but it engages a parallel supernatural scenario. So when you do something here, you know that the book of Revelation talks about, I saw flashes and heaven was open and the Ark of the Covenant was there? Well, wait, I thought the Ark of the Covenant was here. Well, how's it there? I believe there's a here and a there principle. I believe that right now we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. There's here and there's there. As it is in heaven there, so let it be on earth. But the way you cause that to happen is by what you do here. There it's grace, here it's faith. I'll draw this on the board in a moment. I really need you to get this today, and this works for every part of your Christian experience, every part. So here, mortal men give tithes. People are like, tithe is not in the Bible. Well, it's in Hebrews 7, 8. Argue with that. And if you do argue with it, stay broke. I really mean that. I love you, but I, I mean it. I only say these things because I've proved it. I've proved God. God just has this thing about being believed. He's got a real thing about it. If you don't believe God with your actions, you will not see the reactions that are biblical. Period. It's just the way it operates. So here mortal men receive tithes. There it is witnessed of whom he lives. In other words, Jesus receives it in heaven, period. Here you receive it, there he receives it. If you want a supernatural experience, you pray here, a supernatural thing happens in the unseen. 
Praise God. It works. So I think that's awesome. I think that's really good. So the next time you're tithing or sowing or giving, you just need to recognize, wait a second. I'm engaging something in the realm of the unseen. It's not about, I don't have to do that. Well, there's a lot of things you don't have to do in the New Testament under grace. You can, there's actually a lot of things you could technically argue and get away with in the permissive will of God or in the area where you're like, well, I'm just going to get into heaven by the skin of my teeth, by grace alone, hallelujah, and you lived a life like a heathen. Then I question if you ever really came through the door or not. But when you really start to look at this, I don't want to read the Bible for all the things that I can get away with, get away from, argue out of. I want to double down and go for all that God has. The full experience. The gospel you hear preached is correct. And legalists <laughs> and uh, cessationists and all that kind of stuff, you know, the ones that say we're going to have a conference about all the stuff God doesn't do. <laughs> Too much? Everybody okay? <laughs> but you recognize this, though, that the gospel here preached is correct. Jesus died, was resurrected on the third day, but it's not complete until it's working through you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. This, you know, I, that's why Heather said we preach a complete gospel. You know, there's the full gospel, there's the, you know, there's the, we believe in this, you know, the apostles and prophets, they're not around today, you know, they went away with the last apostle, and you got to just really do some serious biblical calculus to come up with that mess. And they, they do it, and they, you know, they'll paint by numbers into a corner, and they're like, and here's my conclusion, twice dead, hallelujah, right? Okay, whatever. So then you recognize, though, that... <laughs> The gospel you hear preached is correct, but it's not complete until it's working through you. The gospel is just, it's not a thing. It's not, a, it's not an understanding. It's not simply something that you go, I understand all the spiritual laws now, and you hang it on the wall like a diploma. The gospel isn't really alive until it's moving through the body of Christ. Amen. And when that gospel is coming through you, it will be demonstrated with signs, wonders, miracles. God will back up his word. And when people are bold enough to declare it and act on it, in all the areas, you're just in the complete gospel. I think it's Colossians that says, we are complete in Him. We're complete. And man, you know what the enemy really wants is he, if he can't stop you from getting born again, he'll stop you from getting the benefits of salvation. Religion loves to hold you back from the benefits. There's a, that group, you know, that's all into cessationism and all that stuff, and I bless them. I have nothing but love in my heart. They do not. Because their main father who started things, you know, you know Calvin, John Calvin? God bless everybody. He had a friend named Michael Servetus. And this man, Michael Servetus, would not go down the same avenues of doctrine as Calvin, and so one thing led to another, and they decided to burn his friend alive. And Calvin stood and was a part of that. And Servetus pleaded with him, please, let's not do this. And he's like, you need to basically believe like me or you're dead. Friends. And Calvin let him burn. He murdered him. So that same spirit of murder gets on that culture, and that's why they're so aggressive. When they talk to you, and then, you know, they don't like it when you say stuff like, you act a lot like the founder of your movement. Just blesses people really well. Remember when Jesus is arguing with the uh, Pharisees? He was arguing with the Pharisees, and and they said all kinds of terrible things to Jesus, right? <laughs> you know, I, just think about the way Jesus preached. My goodness. He's arguing with the Pharisees. They're coming at him. And they're saying, you know, um, Jesus said, you only act this way towards me because you don't believe in my father. You dishonor me. You dishonor my father, and therefore you dishonor me. And they're like, your father? 
you know, we're, who is your father? And then they said stuff to him like, we weren't born of illegitimate means. Remember? And they said, our father's Abraham. He, and Jesus said, oh, no, 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 no. Your father is not Abraham, but you dishonor me and you dishonor my father. If you knew my father, you would honor me. You're of your father. And they're like, we have no father but God. And Jesus kept coming back at them. No, no, God is not your father. And then they said, you know, our father is Abraham. And he said, no, I tell you, before Abraham was I am. Now all these people say Jesus never told them he was God. He told them all the time. I don't think you understand. I'm God. I ain't country. I'm rock and roll. <laughs> so Jesus is there and, and <laughs> I'm God. And they're like, oh. They're like, you are not yet 50 years old and you say that Abraham saw your day, saw you? And Jesus, that's when he said, I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. And Abraham saw my day and he was glad. He said, but no, you're a, of your father. Your father. The devil. <laughs> and then they got really unhappy. It says they picked up rocks to stone him took him to the edge of the cliff, and Jesus turned around and walked through the middle of them. Amen. You know why he did that? Because it wasn't his time. He was all life. Yep. Jesus was all life. I've thought about it. You could have cut him in half, and he wouldn't have died. Think about it. When he was on the cross, they didn't kill Jesus. He said, no man takes my life from me. I give it up willingly. To you, Father, I commit my spirit. They did not kill Jesus. He paid the price of suffering and then gave up his life, gave up the ghost. Ha. I love it when they came to the Garden of Gethsemane to get him, and it was the temple foot soldiers, and there was like, what, 600 plus, nearly 700 of them that came to get Jesus? Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's sweating blood because he's so stressed out about what he's about to step into that he's sweating blood. It was that serious for him. And people say, no, he knew what he was doing. God's in control. I got to tell you, Jesus was wrestling with his humanity and what he had to do. And he said, Lord, if this is possible, is there any other way? Is there any other way? I mean... I can't even imagine being separated from you. Uh, and what I'm going to go through physically is unbearable. Is there, is there any other way? But If not, your will be done. I'll do it. I'll do it. That's why Hebrews said, through suffering, he learned obedience as a son. And because of that, he was given the name above all names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and tongue confess. The name above all names. Man, it's awesome. So he's there, and I believe the devil, since the beginning of Jesus' birth and arrival on the scene, was trying to challenge him the way he challenged the first Adam with his identity. He challenged the first Adam with his identity by saying, did God say? And then he challenged Eve with food. And by the way, the epistles show that Adam was right next to her. Adam wasn't afar off on all that. He watched it go down. He was responsible with Eve for that one. He was the head, and he's there allowing it to go down. And when you look at this whole picture, Jesus is in Gethsemane from the very beginning. The devil had Adam's authority over the earth. He had the whole control of the planet. Why? Because Adam had it. The devil deceived Adam. Adam believed the devil's word over God's word. Therefore, he put his authority into the hands of the devil. And when that happened, the devil who'd been cast out or wherever you look at the timeline of these things, the devil had suddenly no longer been exiled to the level he was. Suddenly, he now had authority on the earth. He became the prince of the air, the god of this world. 
because that was Adam's place. The devil had it now. And you see that in the book of Job. You know, they had this collision, the devil and his angels and all that. Suddenly in the book of Job, the sons of God appear before him, and along comes Lou. And the Lord says, where have you been? He's like, oh, I've been traipsing all over the world, walking back and forth on it, because it's mine. Actually, I don't think he knew. You know that? I don't think the devil knew what he had. Because he said, you know, you got all these people serving you, God. And the Lord said, have you considered my servant Job? Have you seen this guy? And the devil stands there and he's like, ah. He's like, you got a hedge of protection around him. I can't touch him. Can't do anything with him. But you know what? You allow some things to go down and he'll curse you to your face. But the interesting part is then God says to the devil, see, all he has is in your hand. Only not his life, because life and death is in his tongue, right? So the devil, I don't think, realized how much he actually got from Adam, meaning he didn't know that he could actually do some pretty wild stuff to Job. He didn't know that all the world was now under his dominion. That's why he could call fire down. That's why he could throw sickness on him. That's why he could do all this crazy stuff. Because now he's operating in Adam's dominion, and Adam's job was to be fruitful and multiply, keep the garden expanding until it went around the whole world. But now the prince of death is there. Lulu. And he's got Adam's authority. So then you go all the way past Job, you come all the way to the New Testament. Jesus shows up, comes out of the wilderness and the power of the Spirit, and he goes through all those temptations with the devil. And one thing the devil says to him is, hey, see all these kingdoms of the world? Yeah, they've been given to me. And I can give them to whomever I want. You just got to do one thing. You got to take a knee and kiss the ring. You got to bow down to me. Right? And Jesus, of course, responds with, it is written. You can't do that. Tried to tempt Jesus with the same thing he took out the devil or took out Adam with, food. Turn these stones into bread. Come on. Do it. You're hungry. You've been fasting. Turn these stones into bread. You, you should do this. And then he starts quoting scripture to Jesus. He uses, uh, the devil's the lead singer of a, a rock band called Twisted Scripture. Oh, I'm not going to teach truth, right? No, I don't teach truth. You are welcome. And, and then there's, there's the devil doing these things. And he's doing all this to Jesus. And I believe the whole assault he had against Jesus was to change his view of his own identity because Jesus came as a man. He emptied himself. That's what the Bible teaches us. He emptied himself. The, Hebrew, the Greek word for that is kenosis. He emptied himself of all heavenly knowledge and he had to study to show himself approved. That's why when he was 12, he's in the temple talking with the attorneys. Don't you know I'd be in my father's house, Mom? And they're astonished at this kid's understanding. Jesus was learning as a man. And supernatural revelation came to him. And I believe when he met John the Baptist, something really took off. Okay? Now, all of a sudden, here's Jesus standing in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. Those soldiers are coming. And as the soldiers are coming, Jesus had been on this whole process, I believe, of figuring out who he really was. I think he knew it. He told people, I am God. I'm doing all these things. But in Gethsemane, he finally came to the crux. He came to the conclusion of his purpose, his calling, who he was. So it wasn't just enough to know his identity and what he was to do. He had to have it all together. And I believe he'd said, I am he, I am God, I am this. But in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's asking God, do I really have to go through with this? And I believe it became solidified in him. Remember when the disciples, they're all sleeping, and he's like, you can't stay with me even one hour? I'm alone. I am contending for the fate of the universe. And you guys are sleeping. 
And I don't think Jesus berated them. I think he was just so hurting and so wrestling with this that he had to stand alone because they couldn't even support him. And finally, he knew who he was. It came up in him because then when the soldiers came and they said, okay, Judas kisses him. Jesus is like, really? You betray your master with a kiss? All these guys come, 600, 700 of them. And they said, where is Jesus of Nazareth? And in that moment, he mustered everything that he had experienced in the realm of the unseen and the seen from Adam to the current time, the devil's whole trajectory, stealing from Adam all the way up to the Garden of Gethsemane. And in that garden and in that moment, when they said, where is Jesus of Nazareth? Jesus stepped up to them and said, I am he. But in the Greek, the word he is not there. If you look in your Bible, it's italicized. When it's italicized, it means it's not there in the Greek. Jesus said to their question, where is Jesus, the one they call Jesus of Nazareth, where is he? And Jesus said, I don't think you understand. I am. And when he said this, it says they drew back in John 18 and they fell to the ground. All of them. Six, seven hundred people fell to the ground. Now, in that moment, I don't know how this unfolds. Peter gets a bright idea. He probably saw a sword on the ground. He's like, it's my time, right? <laughs> Peter jumps into action. Shing! He's like, I'll save you, Lord. And there's Malchus. And he's like, Wapa! Malchus' ear flops off. And Jesus is like, Peter, right? And Peter's like, choo, 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 choo. he's just getting all going, right? He's turning into an action movie. Peter's like, I will stop this right now, Lord. Oh my gosh, Peter's something else. And then suddenly, as that's happening, Melchizedek's ears lopped off. It says that there is a shallow grave uh, in Gethsemane. In Gethsemane was a cemetery. Okay, There's a cemetery up there. Have you ever read the account? I think it's in the Gospel of Luke, where it says a young man in a garment goes running into the woods, and as he's running into the woods, all of a sudden they try to catch him. And they reach out and grab the garment, pull it off, and the boy ran away naked into the woods. People think that was John. It wasn't John. In the Greek, that garment that kid was wearing was a burial robe. Burial robe. And Gethsemane was a cemetery. When Jesus said, I am, it was the same I am that came from Mount Sinai. I am that I am. And when he, <laughs> when he said that, I believe it knocked them down. Peter pulls out a sword. This kid pops up out of a grave. Whoa! And starts running, and they're thinking, great, another Lazarus. Get the kid! Get the kid! People are scrambling to get back on their feet. Jesus released such a power from the realm of the Spirit through his identity. I believe it knocked hell, death, all of it back on their heels because he knew he was going to go to the cross. And we start understanding who we are in him. Greater is he, the I am, that is in me than he that is in the world, the Antichrist and the spirit of Antichrist, the devil in him. And we become a dominating force. And that's the same I am that paid for everything that you should be enjoying from the realm of the spirit into the natural. And when we start understanding who we are in him, the great I am, then we become a dominating force. Religion does not like that. Religion says, you're a worm, get on your knees, grovel. That's what the devil wants for you. But you're a chip off the old block. I wanted to say a very special thank you to our partners. Partners, thank you. Whether you've been a partner with us since the very beginning, the early days, or whether you've recently become a part of our partner family, I want to just simply thank you. Because of you, we're able to do so many things that we could never have accomplished without you working with us together. We're so grateful for you. And from the very bottom of our hearts, we wanted to say thank you to you. And we pray for you every day, and we stand with you, and we're believing God is going to do magnificent things through this partner family in the coming days. As a matter of fact, I have a promise from the Holy Spirit about it. Now, if you want to become part of our partner family, or you're even on the fence about it, thinking about it, I would encourage you to do so 
today by going to josephz.com or you can text the keyword give to 719-259-0029. Your partnership helps us advance the gospel and it helps us fulfill the commission God's given us to raise up a million to reach a billion. That's lives. A million clear-eyed, clear-minded reformers to go win a billion, a million for a billion. And we know we can do it with your help. I believe with your help, we can impact the world. And we're looking forward to stepping into this at a greater capacity than ever before. I just want to say thank you and invite you to the family by going to josephz.com today. Well, I'm standing here outside our World Broadcast Center. Now, with the World Broadcast Center, we have a little bit extra land that's on it. Not much, but just enough that if we wanted to add on, we could. I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. But right now, I want to thank so many of you who've participated in making this building what it is. Now, we're getting to the point we're going to take a major lunge forward by faith and by really good planning. And that has to do with television and advanced media. Now we're already taking dramatic steps. One very exciting thing that's happening is the Sid Roth Network has reached out to us and they're having us air our live broadcasts every day simultaneously with their television network. A simpler way of saying it is, when we go live in the morning, they will air that live on their TV network. And I gotta tell you, it is amazing what the Lord's doing to open doors for us and our partners to reach more and more viewers and people all around the world. But to really accomplish this, we've got to develop a call center, a call center that's going to really help you and your family. We want to minister to you more. We want to be able to be present for you in a greater capacity. The way we want to move forward is with a new call center. And I'm talking high touch that beats high tech every time. What does that mean? It means when you call in that you get somebody. We're here for you in real time during our live broadcast. And we have a place that will reach out and minister to you, our partners. And we just want to be here for you. If you're a viewer, a partner, we want to be available. And we have to make a place or more room for the production of our materials, meaning shipping out books to you and teachings and so much more that we are just getting into right now. And that means we have to finish this building. And to do that, we need your help. We need your help through your donations, your time, anything that you can do. By time, I mean prayer, in any way that you can spend your efforts through prayer and faith with us, we so appreciate it. But more than anything else, we're looking for partners that will help us finish this building. And if you have any interest in really sewing into this today and standing with us over the World Broadcast Center, the total cost that we have left to knock this out, to get done with phase one, we're calling it phase one because it's the studios, the building payment to pay it off in full, and in addition to that, to remodel everything inside is 1.2 million. And we're looking to knock that out this year. We need your help. We wanna see this advance and we're thrilled about it. And I wanna say a huge thank you to all of you who've helped with this so far. You've sown, you've stood with us, but we have a little bit more to go. And I'd encourage you to do so today by going to josephz.com and helping us finish up this project so we can move forward and better serve you and the body of Christ. We're so grateful. Remember, it's a million for a billion. And here we are at the World Broadcast Center, and I believe that we together can get this done very quickly. I love you, I bless you, and thank you for your support. I wanna tell you about an amazing opportunity that has just been presented to us. We've had a supernatural door of opportunity open for us. Only God could do what is happening for this ministry right now. And it is involving television, network television, satellite television, going all over the world. Now, there's a lot in store for this, but let me explain. This is a word God's given us to reach a billion people for the gospel. And I feel an urgency for this coming year to advance and go forward because of the uniqueness of what God has spoken in this ministry and through this ministry in media. And here's what we have to do. To accomplish this, we not only have to buy the airtime, but we have to build out a call center and finish this building. And we are in the middle of it right now, but the timeline has just been sped up to fall time so we can be ready for the first of the year when we're gonna to begin to launch out in television in a monumental way. Now we've had an opportunity that is both fiscally responsible and financially amazing the way God has done this for us. And we have to take 
take opportunity right now with it because it won't last long. So here's what I'm asking you. Would you consider supporting us, helping us build out the call center, helping us finish off this building and helping us with the budget of airtime? And it is gonna be a monumental thing and the Lord has given us favor and I can't wait to tell you more and more about it. But if you would consider partnering today over this, I know we can hit this target. I know we can walk through the door and I know we can raise up a million to go win a billion. And I'm telling you, this is a God moment. It's a now word. And I'm asking you if you consider partnering with us over it. Maybe you wanna become a partner or if you are a partner, maybe you'd consider increasing your partnership today or giving a one-time offering. This is an amazing open door for this ministry and this broadcast. Everything we've prayed about, everything the Lord has told us to do is now coming to this monumental moment. Next year, we're gonna reach the masses like never before, but we need your help. Please consider going to josephz.com right now and supporting this amazing open door. Thank you so very much. Well, you know, we're so excited to share that uh, Joseph Z is now a programmer on Daystar. And his show, Voice of God, is dedicated to prophetic jour journalism and faith-filled Bible teaching for the last days. You'll hear unique commentary and biblical teachings that will empower you to see the world through a watchman's lens so you'll know what's coming and what to do about it. And of course, his program debuts this Thursday at 10 p.m. Mark that down. Those of you that love Joseph, and uh, that's 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And here's a look at what you can expect. I'm Joseph Z, and at the age of nine, I had a life-altering encounter with the voice of God. Throughout my life, I discovered God is always speaking. The question is, are you listening? There's a difference between the office of the prophet and the gift of prophecy. Simply put, the office of the prophet is a responsibility to a segment of the body of Christ. You see that in Ephesians 4, verse 11, 12, and 13. Office gifts are there to edify and equip the body, where when you look at different abilities in the body, such as the gift of prophecy, there's not an assignment to the segment of the body. It's not a responsibility. It's just a gift that a person in the body carries. When a person with a gift of prophecy has a responsibility put on them for the body of Christ, a certain section of believers, they are called to step into that with responsibility. That's the difference between the office of the prophet and the gift of prophecy. All right, I'm excited about that, aren't you? Absolutely. Joseph's Joseph a great teacher. I love listening to him. New programmer. Personal friend, and it's gonna be you're gonna be encouraged.